Um, so I guess to start the lecture and just before we um before we uh, crack on, the way I think of MRCP part one and two is that MRCP part one is very much about sort of kind of a bit rote learningy, a bit sort of things that you've come across, whereas part two is more sort of uh lo logical thinking through things and a bit more sort of weighing, understanding things rather than just sort of memorization. This is from a book called Thinking Fast as Thinking Fast and Slow, which I really liked and really got and thinking about this. And I really reflect this in sort of the way I think about things now. So what I've done throughout this lecture is I've pinpointed certain things that are very part one or very part two, for example, so that you can get an idea of sort of what this is pitched at, depending on the exam you're revising. The thing about it is that there's a lot of overlap. So even questions that are in part one can conceivably come up a bit in part two, but it's more about the sort of general trends generally the part two questions are more complex and longer and think about clinical decision making whereas part one is more sort of you know um you know what is the gene associated with this uh you know what is this sort of mechanism and sometimes it allows you to sort of you know think through things in a bit more detail but just sort of a more overall picture and again just in neurology just because neurologists love to think about differentials really when you think about neurology as a general concept you're thinking about the where which is the sort of you know where is the lesion you know, and that comes across from the clinical symptom signs, Parkinsonism, peripheral neuropathy, cerebral disease. And then afterwards, you think about the what, which is traditionally the sort of surgical sieve. And then you think about the sort of top three differentials and you tend to sort of investigate accordingly. Um, obviously, some neurologists will just investigate everything in one go, which is fine. But when you're thinking in the exam structure, this is sort of the rough concept in terms of how neurologists think, at least. Because realistically, you know, the people that will write the questions will write the question, particularly for part two, or write questions according to cases they've seen that they found interesting, and they will sort of allow you to think about things, which is kind of, <clears throat> for those of you who use QuestMed uh, as an undergraduate, there's this kind of slightly tongue-in-cheek meme type thing where users always tell each other to spend more time on the wards, and it's sort of slightly annoying because, you know, it's telling people that they should ask, get this question right. But equally, I think that there is, you know, this sort of thread of value to it where, a lot of the stuff that comes up in the exam is actually stuff you've come across in your day to day. So it really is about sort of things that, you know, the decisions that your consultants make that you will have thought about with them. So, you know, as a general rule, even if you're doing part one and two soon, I would always recommend that if someone makes a decision, even if you're speaking to like a specialist or whatever, um, ask them why they made that decision. So it helps you develop that framework for yourself. Sorry, this is just sort of rough philosophical undertakings of MRCP part one and two. Uh, and then I think what I've tried to do in this lecture is to pinpoint to you the kind of, I would say, more high yield stuff, to be honest with you. So for those who are coming here looking for a very detailed undertaking of each of these conditions, I would say this is not the right place. This is more to sort of jog your memory about the various conditions, pinpoint certain sort of high yield facts, and then sort of allow you to, you know, focus on reading and understanding and sort of reading, you know, going through it and saying, ah, this is what Yezan was talking about earlier. I remember this, this sort of sort of repetition, uh, you know, speech repetition for those who like to use it. Um, and, you know, that's, that's roughly what we're going to go through. <clears throat> Obviously, if you have any questions or you want some more clarification, then just let me know at the end and we can uh, discuss it in a bit more detail. And I can, under I can explain things. So to start off with, we'll talk about stroke. Um, I think people get very upset and, you know, uh, very... Uh, formal about stroke when you're talking about uh, classification, right? And obviously you've got this sort of Bamford Oxford classification of ischemic stroke, which realistically no one really uses anymore. So it's not really important to learn, but I think the concepts are important. The, 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 I think really it's really about anterior, posterior and lacunar. In the anterior stroke, obviously you get this contralateral um, hemiplegia or hemonis myopia or higher cortical dysfunction. Whereas in the posterior stroke, you will tend to get, not always, but more often than not, you will get some brainstem stuff, eye movement disorders, cerebellar dysfunction. This will help you sort of localize where things are. Obviously, if you have someone with just an isolated vertigo, it's less likely to be a stroke. But if someone's got risk factors, often if, you're, if you've been an ED doctor, uh, especially it seems for me that that's what seems to be everything in reverse to me. Uh, this guy has vertigo. Does he have a stroke? Uh, and yes, it's possible, but in the most of the time, it, it has to really be associated with something else to make it a bit more realistic and also risk factors. And finally, this concept of a lacunar infarct, which is a sort of an infarct in the deep, um, 
the deep outpatchings of the so not outpatchings, deep branches of the middle cerebral arteries, you can get sort of pure motor, pure sensory, or a sensory motor stroke. Um, and that's sort of the rough idea of sort of stroke in general in terms of localization. You do get some stroke questions in MRCP, which is quite helpful. Um, so this is sort of a rough idea of how to approach it. I think also when you're thinking about stroke, and this is a, there's a lot of diagnostic uncertainty when you think about TIA. Obviously, with TIA in the past, you used to use this ABCD2 score, which no one uses anymore. If you have a TIA or you're worried about a TIA, you refer and they get seen within 24 hours. Obviously, there are lots of mimics. The most common mimic that we see as in neurology is migraine with aura. But the other thing, which is sort of something to be aware of, which again, this is more about clinical reasoning in the MRCP part two. It's about sort of thinking about if this is a seizure with Todd's paresis, for example, which is where you get weakness after having a seizure, usually gets better within sort of, uh, you know, a couple of hours or maybe within a day. So if someone has recurrent episodes of weakness, you really need to think about whether or not it's a migraine or a seizure. Obviously, there's other causes you can see here, but, and obviously there's, um, this is another reason why, if you're not sure, then worth just you know, worth scanning, as you can see, to start off with. But invariably, when they go to TI clinic, they'll get an MRI, and they will tend to sort of get all the uh, vascular risk factors sorted as well, which we'll talk about in the next slide. So if they go to TI clinic, or actually if they get admitted in a hyperacute stroke unit, this is basically what we'll look at. Um, this is a nice mnemonic, which I find quite helpful. Halts, you do hypertension, antiplatelets or anticoagulation, lipids, tobacco, sugar, my diabetes, and, and surgery. So just some key points. Nowadays, um, traditionally, it, different hospitals will have different protocols for anticoagulation, sorry, antiplatelets. So don't worry too much about sort of what it is. In our hospital, we give 300 milligrams of clopidogrel and then continue with aspirin. Um, sometimes we do something really different. So I don't think you will be asked about the exact dose, so don't worry about it too much. But if you have something like atrial fibrillation or cardiac thrombus, we tend to start anticoagulation. And that can be either early or late. If it's like a big stroke, we tend to do it a bit later. If it's a very small stroke, we tend to do it earlier within a few days. Um, but again, this is subject to a lot of randomized controlled trials. So again, I don't think you'll be asked about it, just to know the concept. And finally, I, I suspect a fairly common question will be, when do you do surgery in patients who have had a stroke or a TIA? And uh, the answer is, if you have the sort of gold standard is, if you have ipsilateral carotid artery stenosis, for example, you've got left-sided carotid artery stenosis, and you've got a left-sided stroke, ipsilateral leading to right-sided weakness, then with 70 to 90%, you should really consider a carotid endarlectomy. And that's sort of a fairly, I would imagine, a common question. Finally, again, sort of within the concept of, um, <coughs> within the concept of uh, stroke, Horner syndrome is sort of something that you will have learned a lot about in medical school generally. Uh, traditionally, we're taught that there's associated with a pancos tumor it's affecting the sympathetic plexus, leading to the sort of classical signs you can see here, ptosis, meiosis, and hydrosis. But in the context of stroke, especially if someone has a young, is a young person, 45, 50 year old with a stroke, you need to really rule out the carotid dissection. And one of the sort of telltale signs could be that they have a Horner syndrome. The reason for that is if you guys got carotid, the sympathetic plexus is over it, you get a dissection, disrupts the sympathetic supply, and therefore you get a Horner syndrome. So it's something, and that's why sometimes they might say, oh, you know, what's what's a patient, what's the what's the next best step in a patient who comes in with a Horner syndrome acutely? The answer is a CT angiogram, because you want to see if there's a dissection. Um and then just to sort of go through hyperacute stroke, um, again, this is a very confusing field. The reason I've put this in is because I remember from my part one or part two, maybe it was part two, actually, uh, we, I had a question on thrombectomy, which is wild, actually, because at the time when I did it in 2019, it was all very new. But given it came up, I just thought, you know what, it's, it's I might as well talk about it. And basically, you have these, like, we do CT head, angiogram, and perfusion generally, um, if they come in within about sort of, you know, within a day. And uh, we have these traditional parameters, 4.5 hours, 6 hours. But uh, there are these more modern parameters where we use CT perfusion. So if they've, you know, if they're within 9 hours and they've got good baseline and good perfusion, we will tend to give them thrombolysis. And equally, if they've got thrombectomy within 24 hours and a good perfusion, we will also give them thrombectomy as well. Obviously, there are complications thrombolysis, which again, you will probably remember from your sort of medical school days, maybe uh, head trauma, recent surgery, high blood pressure, low platelet count, et cetera. And these are some stuff that I remember from my revision. 
um, modified ranking scale is used to assess functional status. <laughs> part and part one, alteplase is a tissue plasminogen activator. This is one of those things where you just have to ready like, oh, this came up as a question. The other point is that sometimes they do ask you about scales. So I remember, I, I think it might be in the MRCP, um, one of the practice questions, like what's the water low score or low water low scale, which I think is like a pressure sore thing. So sometimes they ask you things that you may have come across being in a Jerry's ward or something like that. So it is important to kind of think broadly about your memory as a clinician. Uh, so it's kind of a mix of, I would say the key to success is being having a good understanding of the broad complexes or sort of thought patterns, having some sort of rote learning, remembering thing, and then sort of relying on your clinical experience. Um, so if you can delay it slightly and have had more medical experience, it, it does help, I think. And um, I would say that, um, so someone's asking if they, if you have good perfusion, I mean, a good CT perfusion, that means that there's a good sort of amount of brain that is um, the amount of brain that is there is to save it can get a bit complex and that's beyond the scope of this talk uh, but at the end if you really want to i can tell you uh, anyways so obviously there's two types of stroke there's infarct and there's hemorrhage you kind of sometimes get these like um image-based questions particularly in part two and also you get some sort of less uh um sort of more not less imaging questions but more sort of you know the, the it'll tell you where the bleed is the only thing I would just want to mention from this is that if you have something that's in the middle, sort of subcortical, the most likely cause is hypertension of bleed. Whereas if it's low bar, the most likely cause tends to not be a bleed. And therefore, you might need some further investigations like a digital subtraction, distraction angiography, like a DSA. And that could be something like um, cerebral amyloid angiography, um, angiopathy, and uh, like things like tumors or vascular malformations as well. Um, yeah, just to be aware of, there's obviously other differentials. So you always need to ask about things like cocaine or whatever, but generally speaking, this is how you think about looking at images. Um, again, I'm being very high yield here. So sort of bear with me. Um, I just wanted to talk about some brief anti-epileptic side effects. The valparate can cause quite a lot of stuff, weight gain, hammer, a tremor, hair loss, teratogenicity in the UK. It's very hard to prescribe valparate, and there's a very uh, very young women who are of childbearing age. So teratogenicity is a huge problem. A lot of the antiepileptics are teratogenic, to be honest. So it, you know have to sort of be fairly cautious about what you give. But these are the sort of the the most um, uh, significant ones, as you can see. Uh, carmazepine gives you drowsiness. Levetiracetam can cause mood changes, so you don't really want to give it with someone who's got significant depression. Uh, to pyramate, uh, drowsiness, paresthesia, teratogenicity. Um, the one that's common in MRCP, I would say, as a like spot diagnosis, quote unquote, is uh, is phenytoin. And the classic thing is, sorry, it's not gym hyperplasia, it's gum hyperplasia. And uh, you get uh, megaloblastic anemia. That's sort of a very common thing for phenytoin, just to be, be uh, sort of cognizant of. Um, when you have status epilepticus, there are some trials that have shown uh, that you, if you, someone who is, we call benzodiazepine sort of uh, not responsive, uh, what's the word, I'm not responsive, sort of resistance. So if you're giving benzodiazepine that don't work, you can equally give Enito and Valbrate or Levitorastam. Um, Levitorastam is sort of the easiest to get to. And, and to be honest, most most nowadays, we just give Levitorastam Kepra because it's easily available. Obviously, you can give the other ones uh, if they are available. Um, just sort of for reference in terms of if it's an option. The other thing, again, for reference is this concept of enzyme inducers and inhibitors. You get it a lot in antiepileptics. These are some mnemonics I use and I still use today when I think about uh, antiepileptics. Enzyme inducers, sickfaces.com, and sort of what their relationship. And the usual thing is the whether the relationship to warfarin, if the INR goes up and down, and also to the oral contraceptive pill. This is sort of the classic questions that you get. It's worth memorizing this, to be honest, if I were you. Uh, just sort of, again, segueing to Parkinsonism, um, I would say that the you may get questions, particularly in part two, asking about Parkinsonism as a sort of, you know, what is the most likely diagnosis? Uh, you get idiopathic Parkinson's disease, which is the most common um, cause of Parkinsonism, which you get tremors, rigidity, bradykinesia, postural stability. And traditionally, these this is asymmetrical. You generally don't need to do any diagnoses, uh, sorry, any um, investigations. Um, if you're not sure, you could do an MRI, you can do a DAT scan. But um, if you're not sure, then you kind of do it. For the most part, you can just diagnose it there and then and start treatment if they need it. 
And then obviously there's differentials for lots of different causes. You can get vascular Parkinsonism if they've got lots of small vessel disease or uh, if they've had drugs like antipsychotics. And there's Parkinson's plus syndrome, which I'll talk about in the next slide. And there's obviously lots of complications. The most common is dementia and depression. Those are sort of the things that to, to be aware about in patients who have Parkinson's. So this is where it gets a bit more complex. Again, I've only really highlighted them because these are things that people struggle with. And actually, you will not really have much experience of this, even if you're on the ward. Like, you know, I don't think I've, I've personally seen many patients with um, Parkinson's plus syndrome personally, because I've not done movement disorders as a sort of subspecialty yet. So therefore, the expectation is that, you know, you wouldn't have seen them otherwise. So again, I'm afraid this is a sort of more of a um, kind of general viewpoint of how things are. Uh, the, 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 the sort of two at the top, <coughs> two at the top dementia Lewy bodies and multiple system atrophy, they're called synucleopathies um, in terms of the pathology, whereas the bottom two, PSP, CBD, um, are tauopathies, and there is a secondary to some different disease processes. Again, you could get a question on that. Dementia with Lewy bodies, basically, you get Parkinson, but you just get dementia before the Parkinsonism. It's on the same sort of spectrum. And I would say the thing that connects all the Parkinson's plus syndrome, generally speaking, is that they progress quickly, number one. Number two, they don't respond well to L-DOPA. And uh, you get, with muscle system atrophy, I would say the, the, oh, sorry, and the other thing is that it tends you know, you can be more symmetric, whereas in Parkinson's disease, it's more asymmetric. Um, again, this is sort of just broad sort of strokes here. Uh, and finally, in progressive supranuclear palsy, you get this vertical gaze paresis. And finally, in cortic basal degeneration, you get apraxia, where effectively, <coughs> if you ask a patient to do certain things, so it doesn't do that, for example, or do that, they can't do it. And that's kind of what is known as motor apraxia. They get this alien hand syndrome where they don't know, you know, with their hand and uh, that, that that is their hand. But again, this is sort of more severe disease. It's just a general understanding of sort of the different Parkinson's plus syndromes as a sort of rote memorization type thing. Um, if you look at the NICE guidelines, although obviously the NICE guidelines are, you know, UK based and MRCP is international exam. If someone has any motor symptoms that impact the quality of life, we would normally start them on levodopa. But of course, there are lots of different uh, options that we can give. Levodopa, dopamine agonists, anti-muscular index, MAO inhibitors, lots of stuff. Um, the only thing I would mention is that dopamine agonists can make you become, can activate a separate pathway, which is more of your sort of reward pathway. And that can lead to sort of disinhibition, can lead to sort of, you know, things like gambling problems and whatever. So it's something to be aware of if someone is started on that. And finally, if you have someone with Parkinson's, ideally, you shouldn't really be starting them on any antipsychotics because it makes the Parkinson's worse. Um, it's difficult in the elderly because, you know, someone may have dementia with, with Lewy bodies and then they, they've they got really bad you know, psychiatric problems and you want to give them a antipsychotic. It can be quite challenging, but it's just something to be aware of that you shouldn't really give it unless you really, really, really need to. So um, we move on to ophthalmoplegia, which is um, um, <coughs> uh, very important, actually. So I think there's this concept. The first concept I'd like to talk about is um, the this concept of sort of medical versus surgical uh, third nerve palsy. So the idea really is that Surgical third nerve palsies are what are when you need to involve the neurosurgeons. Medical is when you need to involve the medics, the neurologists rather. The idea is that on the outside of the nerve, you have parasympathetic neurons. So if you're something is pushing on the outside, you get dilated pupil. Whereas in a medical, it's not affecting the outside; it's the inside. So you've got like a like a mini stroke or like ischemia secondary to um, not a mini stroke, a small stroke, or a, a like ischemia secondary to diabetes or or any sort of vascular cause, it will not affect the pupil. But the problem is, it's not like a set rule. So, you know, it's not always surgical versus medical in the sense that, oh, no, okay, the pupil is fine. Let's not, you know, think about it. If you're not sure, we tend to just um, either get, uh, you know, do obviously we tend to do scans anyways, but we may do an additional scan, like a CT angiogram to look for any aneurysms, for example. That's the only thing we do. Um, the only other thing I'd say, uh, just going forward, is there's a concept called uh, intranuclear thumb plegium, which I've put here. You can see here is that 
it's a very particular clinical syndrome where you get nystagmus on one side and you get failure of adduction, that's a deduction towards the inside, as you can see here from this image. And that is affecting, that is secondary to the medial longitudinal fasciculus, which connects the third, fourth, and sixth nerves. That can be secondary to, um, traditionally, we think about multiple sclerosis, but stroke is another very common cause in the elderly or, you know, whoever gets a stroke. <laughs> And um, the other thing is um, sixth nerve palsy. So obviously, traditionally, we think of sixth nerve palsy as uh, a cause of a raised sort of a reflection of raised intracranial pressure. And that's true if you're a neurosurgeon and you have someone who's coming with a trauma and they've, you know, they're, they've got sixth nerve palsy, fine. But generally speaking, like if you're a medic, you don't really see someone who's coming with, you know, a huge amount of trauma and they've got sixth nerve. It's generally sort of unexplained sixth nerve. So from my experience, sixth nerve palsy, the palsy tends to be the same idea as the third. You get, it's usually like a vasculopathy, like diabetes or vascular disease. But again, you can get inflammatory causes and sort of malignance and things like malignancy and things like that. But generally speaking, from my experience, vasculopathy is the most likely. That should be a really sort of up there differential for a lot of these ophthalmoplegias. Finally, fourth nerve palsy, trauma is one of them. You can get sort of inflammatory causes, MS, malignancy, stuff like that as well. Um, so... Again, sort of multiple sclerosis, you don't really need to know that much about multiple sclerosis, to be honest. Yeah, I think you just need to know that there's different types. You get this relapsing, remitting, secondary progressive, primary progressive, and it's only upper motor neuron. Just the thing about relapse is, and maybe, you know, if at the end of this lecture, this will teach you how to think about MS when you're speaking to a neurologist, uh, this is sort of my inner neurologist coming to play sort of if you're not planning on becoming a neurologist it's really important that if someone has a relapse or you think they've got a relapse you should just check for uti steroids can uh, speed up relapse recovery but doesn't have an effect on overall outcome if they have an optic neuritis iv methylpred is preferred uh, because there are some studies that have shown that it's uh, better for or sort of improves uh, relapse recovery but um, it's not sort of not the evidence is slightly inconclusive, but that's generally what we do. Generally, you don't need to know that much about MS, to be honest, as long as it's a differential when you're thinking about things. And again, as I was talking about earlier, you do this sort of sensory loss. There's lots of, it can be anything in the brain. So see this image of sort of lots of little MS lesions coming to play over the years, um, and it can cause anything, right? Uh, sensory loss, optic neuritis, intermediate thanoplegia, subacute ataxia, you know, and the diagnosis really is what we call is using the McDonald's criteria. We tend to do an MRI uh, with contrast with MRI brain and spine. And also we do oligoclonal bands in the CSF. More, most importantly, you do it paired. So you compare the CSF oligoclonal bands with the serum. And it should be obviously more so in the CSF than it is in the serum. So yeah. Um, I'll do questions at the end, by the way. Does anyone know what this is in the chat? Um Any ideas? Yes, no? I've just talked about MS. This is uh, progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, PML. The reason I mention this is because lots of the MS drugs that we give can lead to immune suppression, and therefore it can lead to lots, it can lead to you know certain uh, sort of infections. One of them is called this JC virus, uh, previously sort of it's called uh because the first person that had it was called john cunningham jc and it basically is a worsening of um function associated with um significant sort of white matter changes as you can see here and it tends to be irreversible unfortunately so that's why we don't go and give sort of everyone <laughs> the uh sort of immunosuppressive treatment especially the sort of harder ones something to be aware of in terms of the complication of the treatments that we give uh anyone know this is uh any idea uh yes yeah, so yeah so someone's saying transverse myelitis so basically you need to think broadly about it you need to think about this is sort of um a, a longitudinally enhancing sort of myelitis or sort of a, a lesion in the brain, in the, in the spine, a longitudinally sensitive lesion, sorry. There are many differentials. The most common that we think about is neuromyelitis optica, 
which where you get this sort of transverse myelitis and optic neuritis, acroporin 4 antibodies. You also get loads of random conditions. Um, but the ones I would sort of say is you get this ADEM, acute demyelinating cephalomyelopathy, anti-MOG, sarcoid, and you can get sort of tumors and infections and like that. It's just being aware that these are the differentials that we think about. So if you're thinking, if you see this, you need to see sending for acroporin 4, you need to look in the back of the eye, et cetera, et cetera. So these are the things that we think about. But it can be anything. Uh, moving forward um, so that we can crack on. Again, I'm, I'm doing this very quickly so that we can run through as much as we can and sort of so I can highlight the key points to guide your revision, right? Um, Guillain-Barre, again, very common. Um, it's a, um, we see it a lot. We It's an ascending polyneuropathy. It's a lower motor neuron condition. Um, you can get sort of, sens normally, most likely it's sensory motor, but uh, you can also get like a pure motor um, neuropathy tends to be associated with particular infections, um, mycoplasma, campylobacter, CMB, EBB. Sometimes, a lot of time we just don't know. Um, you know, the sort of classic ideas that you have someone who has a dodgy takeaway or, you know, traveled abroad and had some food they weren't sure about and then they come in with this, right? Um, the big risk with Guillain-Barre is that they, um, it's a high risk of respiratory failure. And also they get like loads of um, tachycardias and sort of hypertension, hypotension. So, you know, I've, I've seen people that, you know, maybe older people with lots of risk factors who've had heart attacks secondary to all this sort of autonomic dysfunction. So basically you need to make sure that they're seen and they, you know, they get reviewed by the ITU team very early. And then <coughs> the, uh, we normally do FBC. So FBC is the best um, way of seeing if they're going to deteriorate. So AB, once if you're doing ABGs and they're hypoxic on the ABG, it's kind of too late. So don't wait for the ABG, you need to do FBC. And then the treatments really is sort of plasma exchange, IVIG. Those are the ones that we sort of normally treat. They're used to treat. And actually, once you finish the acute episode, prognosis is actually quite good. So they tend to normally get better, more or less, within a certain period of time, like a year or two. They sort of, not always, but a lot of time they get, go back to normal. Um, in the next slide, uh, we'll talk about the treatments. But there's only one thing is that there's kind of loads of different subtypes of Guillain-Barre, which I kind of alluded to earlier. You can get this sort of classic sensory motor, pure motor, but the one I just wanted to highlight because it can come up in part one and part two is this GQ1B gangliocide antibodies, which is associated with Miller-Fisher syndrome. And that tends to be this sort of polyneuropathy, arms, legs, but also you get this ophthalmoplegia, which is hard because you can get ophthalmoplegia in Guillain-Barre. You know, you get loads of stuff, cranial nerves, that wise. Like you can get bilateral facial palsy in, in Guillain-Barre. So... It's, I would say, if someone comes in with ophthalmoplegia, I would still think Guillain-Barre is more likely because this is rare, but this is a differential to consider. Uh, and again, there's another sort of subtype, which is very rare, called Bickerstaff encephalitis, where you get a bit more of a sort of drowsiness and confusion and things like that. <clears throat> He's a Nature article, which I think I've got to in the next slide, talks about it in more detail. The thing I just like to really pinpoint to you, because I think it will come up uh, very commonly, is this concept of the, the classic finding in a CSF or a Guillain-Barre. And basically you get this sort of a elevated protein and a normal cell count, basically just a very high albumin and a sort of low cell count called albino, albuminocytological dissociation as a classical finding in Guillain-Barre. And then the first line treatment that we normally give is IVIG, as you can see here. And then if that doesn't work, we consider, or if it doesn't really lead to much, we may consider giving plasma exchange. Um, and yeah, so that's sort of the rough idea. And I sort of talk about here, this Nature article is actually quite good if you have some time to read it. Um, yeah, that's sort of the, the only thing I really want to say about Guillain Barre. Um, um, mentioned it briefly, seventh nerve palsy. The bane of my life when I'm a stroke reg, I must say, uh, oh, this this 90 year old uh, nursing home patient's face is a bit lopsided. Is it a stroke? Classic. Uh, so uh, hopefully, at the very least, um, they will learn the, the tricks of the trade. And you know, I think it's really hard because you, you, you most of the time you won't have seen the patient before. They don't know what they look like. But generally speaking, upper motor neuron versus lower motor neuron. The upper motor neuron is forehand sparing, and the reason for that is because the <coughs> forehead is supplied by both sides of the brain so if there's a brain problem the this will be spared whereas if it's a nerve problem yeah this completely cut off so therefore it won't be spared um upper motor neuron stroke multiple sclerosis, inflammatory tumors things like that lower motor neuron the most common is bell's palsy which we give steroids for 
and then Ramsey Hunt, which is sort of a herpes zoster virus uh, affecting the inner ear. So you always need to look into the back, into the ear as well. But also, you've got things like Lyme disease, sarcoidosis, tumors, things like that. And finally, uh, if you have something that affects five, seven, and eight, that is most likely, and uh, not most likely, but sort of something you need to look at is the cerebello pontine angle, which is where you can get tumors and things like that. If you get sort of bilateral ones, you know, you can sort of think about if they've got like a schwannoma or something like that, which can be associated with certain sort of genetic conditions. But generally speaking, this is something you need to look at. Again, I hope this is sort of, this is obviously, it's a lot to take in, but it's just a general sort of framework of how to think about things. Um, Again, I'm just talking about headache briefly because again, it comes up uh, from clinically and also in, in from RCP. Um, you get the, the way I think about headaches and, and that's how headache specialists think is that primary or secondary, right? Primary ones are ones that are sort of not, you know, don't require urgent intervention or treatment. Uh, migraines, cluster headache, you get, get sort of benign sex headaches which actually look like subarachnoid hemorrhages uh, in terms of the onset. Um, and this is obviously very worrying. But the ones we really need to worry about is obviously the subarachnoid. And you get this thunderclap headache, which is worse at onset. But worse at onset means that it's maximal at onset, really, really, right when it starts, it's bad, and then gets a bit better. That's the truth of the clap headache. Anything that's not that is not really a thunderclap headache, as I will tell you from my many referrals as a neurology registrar. And then if you're not sure, obviously, you can do a lumbar, you do a lumbar puncture after 12 hours, looking for xanthochromia. And then if you if it's positive, then you tend to do a CT angiogram looking for an aneurysm. It's the most common cause. And again, for MRCB, there's a, aneurysms can be associated with sort of what is the kidney disease, sort of a classic association, obviously very rare in clinical practice. And you get these other secondary headaches. Um, this is uh, CVST is one thing that everyone's worried about and everyone freaks out about, which fair enough. And in the, which I've shown here, there's this delta sign, anti-delta sign, where you can see at the bottom here, you get the sort of triangular shape and that's because there's there's a clot there and that's sort of one classical uh, sign of uh, CBST. And finally, you can get headaches secondary to blood pressure. So, so obviously, look, anyone who's got a headache, you really need to look in the back of their eye and equally sort of idiopathic intracranial hypertension. It's another, uh, another differential. But I think the key is really to make sure that you know if it's a primary or secondary headache. If you know if you're happy it's primary, then, you know, what is the next thing you need to do? Um, that's a, that's a rough understanding of things. Um, again, we move forward in a bit more detail so that we can cover everything. Um, my senior gravis is a cold enough condition, I think, uh, as you, you would see. And basically, you get these antibodies against uh, the ACH receptor, uh, although you can't get antibodies to other things. Um, and you get this fatigable muscle weakness. You can get sort of generalized myasthenia or you can get ocular myasthenia, ptosis, diplopia, limb weakness, pulper palsy. And these are sort of investigations that you do. Anti-HCA, HCR also you can do anti-musk antibodies. Uh, you check for CT chest, looking for a thymoma, which everyone should really get. Uh, and then um, you can do uh, EMG neuroconduction studies to look for any evidence of fatigability. Um, recently, I don't know if this will come up in MRCP because this is kind of a relatively new thing. All these like random checkpoint inhibitors they use in oncology now that can precipitate myasthenia. Something to be aware about. I don't know if it will come up in exams, but worth realizing because it's a very like medical thing links together neurology and oncology. So, you know, something to consider. Uh, and then um, <coughs> treatments, anticholinesterase inhibitors, steroids, acutely IVIG or plasma exchange. Uh, there's been a lot of data recently that has shown that uh, anyone who's young enough who has a positive ACH receptor, we give them thymectomy anyways, even if they don't have a thymoma, apparently it makes their symptoms better. Again, a bit niche maybe, I don't know, but it's just worth recognizing as something that we do. So yeah. Um, autoimmune encephalitis. This is again, sort of a you know, question, is this autoimmune encephalitis or not? Uh, I've, uh, let's see if I can get this video. This is uh, from YouTube, so I may show loads of crazy ads. Is it? No. Wait, hold on. No. Okay, I'll send you guys a link of it. Sorry. It's basically someone I'll um I'll, I'll show you. Basically, <coughs> it's it's really hard to diagnose. And you know, it's, it can be argued that loads of people over the years who have psychosis have autoimmune encephalitis, but people is not people just have not diagnosed them. But for your exams, I would say that there's um, there's a couple of like classic subtypes 
that you should be aware about. And I would sort of narrow them down to these three that I mentioned. And LGI1 encephalitis associated with a low sodium and facial brachial seizures, which I've shown here. Basically, you get this sort of uh, small, which is, this is in this video, but which I'll share with you as well. You get these like brachial, sort of brachial seizures there, as you can see from, from me, and these sort of twitches in the face, so facial brachial, so kind of like that. And then that's, that's sort of classic LGI1 encephalitis. Uh, and then obviously, an NDA encephalitis associated with sort of psychiatric symptoms, classically, um, and uh, Casper II, a, a, the classic is a sort of a sleep disorder as well. Um, the treatment tends to be steroids, and obviously plasma exchange can be considered. The only thing I would say about autoimmune encephalitis is that there is this association with paraneoplastic syndromes. I've put the ones here. The one that I remember most clearly from my experience uh, and actually for exams is, and people what people know about the most is probably the one in the middle, NMDA receptor antibodies associated with ovarian teratoma. And that's something that sort of people probably recognize maybe from their uh, their university or some of their experience. But generally speaking, uh, you should really be screening and doing like a CT, chest, abdomen, pelvis. And nowadays in the UK, we, we tend to do PET scans as well, just looking for things. Um, the treatment really is that, so the, the management really is that you scan them, do an MRI, do an LP, send off antibodies, which take ages to come back. And if you're really sure about the diagnosis, you just treat them anyways rather than wait for the antibodies to come back. So that's kind of the rough way of uh, sort of treating this group of patients. Um, again, I'm sort of going back and forth between lots of different things, but this is uh, a mnemonic that a friend of mine made at university, which I remember now and I still use now. And basically, if you've got someone who's got a mixed upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron signs, this is a nice mnemonic. Fred's tabby cat seeks mice. Friedrich's ataxia, tabis dorsalis, cervical spondylopathy, syringomyelia, and motor neuron disease. Um, and this is sort of the main the main causes of a mixed upper motor neuron, lower motor neuron. Obviously, you can have two conditions, which is fair. Um, and then the, another reason I added this is that I can talk a bit about motor neuron disease, which the, the three kind of main facts I think you should know about is that the only real treatment is rilazole. But if you have type 2 respiratory failure, NIV can prolong your survival. And you really need to start considering early PEG because they get sort of um, low sort of bulbar signs. Um, and not everyone, obviously, but then in, in some people, they, they really need to start thinking about to get them a PEG before they lose their bulbar function. And it becomes a question of sort of palliative care and sort of ongoing follow-up. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, again, I'm just literally going through diseases right now because these are the ones that sort of come up and then clinical practice as well. Um, this is idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Uh, the the classic sort of phenotype is the young overweight females. No one knows why you get idiopathic intracranial hypertension, previously known as I think benign intracranial hypertension. It's not benign because you can lose your sight, so there's nothing benign about that. Um, you they think it's because they make a lot of CSF for some reason. I'm not sure why. And if so, basically the main reason to admit someone, even if they're fine or they look fine to you, is if they have visual loss. That's kind of the main thing. That's the, main, the thing that scares neurologists is, is this, if they lose sight. And we need to tend to do a sort of an emergency LP to try and get the pressure, ideally sort of down less than 20. Um, and if they're worse, we, we speak to neurosurgeons, get a VP shunt. In new textbooks before, for my textbooks, we used, they used to say optic neurofenestration, but like... I think where, I've, where, where I work in London, I think one of my consultants told me that like, yeah, no one no one actually does that in London. So, you know, I don't know where you're going to get someone to do optic nerve fenestration, to be honest with you, but, you know, VP shunts is the sort of uh, thing that we do. Uh, we tend to do MRI, MRV, because there's this association sometimes with the venous sinus thrombosis causing increased intracranial pressure. Do the lumbar puncture. If you have a sort of iron deficiency anemia and uh, so sort of hypothyroidism, you, there's a, it can make your IH worse, so you need to check for that as well. The treatments, we tend to give acetazolamide chronically. That reduces the ICP, but can cause paresthesia. Some people don't really tolerate it very well. And the thing about IH is you can also get this sort of migraine-type headache um, alongside your sort of IIH headache, or sort of, it's a bit of a spectrum. But if you're going to give topiramate, topiramate is really good because it can. it's also... Um, a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor to a certain extent, but obviously it's teratogenic and this is a young woman. So you need to be very careful about this. And again, the sort of medical thing is that it can cause kidney stones. 
because it's a compound, it can have risk inhibitor and metabolic acidosis. So it's something to be aware about as well if you're treating this couple of patients. Um, again, on our sort of uh, journey throughout lots of different diseases, mononeuritis multiplex, I've, I've put this because it's a very like medical neurology thing. And the idea really for um, uh, mononeuritis multiplex is that it's this like sequential or simultaneous involvement of, the, I mean, they call it non-contiguous uh, nerve trunks, but basically it just doesn't make sense. So, you know, from patients I've seen, I had a guy who had like an ulnar neuropathy and then two weeks later came back with a foot drop. That makes more sense. Obviously it's harder if you're like, you know, you've got a, you know, somewhere in the arm, the, both sides of the arm that's non-contiguous. But generally speaking, it's, you know, different areas of the brain, of the, of the nervous system. <laughs> and again, it's mainly medical stuff. Diabetes is most common, I would say, but also you can get vascular disease. You get some super rare vascular disease, but also these sort of the ones that you're probably more familiar with from a rheumatological perspective. And uh, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, SLE again, and you get infections and whatever. <laughs> but yeah, that, that's sort of something to consider when you're thinking about uh, mononeuritis. And then I think, now that we've sort of gone through most of it, we'll just talk vaguely about random high yield conditions uh, which again sort of is useful. They will we'll do questions as well now. Um, so random high yield conditions. What's uh, this on the left uh, in the chat on the questions? Does anyone know? Um, it's any ideas? Yeah, Sharkomary two with yeah, CMT. So CMT. Yeah, good. So we'll talk about that. And then what's this in the middle? Anyone know? Um, in the chats, any idea? So, this is a bit more hard. It's harder, isn't it? Charcot tooth is like, oh yeah, I know Charcot tooth. This one's a bit harder. Okay, no one knows. No, no one's saying anything. Fine. Okay, so I'm gonna leave it for a second. And then, what about this last one? It's interesting, isn't it? It's hard sometimes looking at images. Uh, when you do neurology, you kind of you do look at a lot of brain scans, and um, okay, someone's saying papilledema. I wouldn't say it's particular. Is it particularly blurred, or is it something else? Think about it. If it's not blurred, it's what is it? Okay, so it's that's a pale optic disc. Effectively, it's hard, isn't it, with the contrast? Does it look very pale? Maybe it actually doesn't look. Probably the the image will be a bit, a bit better in the actual exam. But um, so I think okay, Sharkamy tooth. Uh, I'll leave the middle one as a surprise so that I keep you guys engaged. Um, so, Charcot-Marie Tooth, autosomal dominant condition, runs in families. It's the most common genetic inherited neuropathy, I think. It's a bit of a sort of random fact, I think, but it's useful. Uh, sensory motor. The thing, the reason I sort of mentioned is because sometimes you can ask the gene. The gene is uh, PMP22. I remember it because of the 50 Cent song um which i'm not going to talk about because it's a lot of swearing in it but if you know you know and uh, that's something to be aware about so shark and mary tooth and then the um second thing is sporadic course field jacob disease so cjd so here what you can see is uh you can see this what we call cortical ribboning so effectively there's two for signs here actually one is the bottom of c here you can see the sort of cortical ribboning which is uh, fairly classical and then here you can see this like what they call the hockey hockey stick sign so in b so there's like one line here and then to the right and that tends to be this sort of unexplained um unexplained uh dementia sort of confusion sort of change in your sort of cognitive status over a period of usually a couple of months and tends to be over 60 and the classical thing that you see is you get this myotonus where you just get this sort of jerking movements associated with your sort of cognitive dysfunction. And that's sort of a classic for CJD. It's rare, to be fair, but it's like one of those things where if you look at it, you're like, ah, okay, that's definitely CJD. So once you know that, you're kind of like, ah, okay, CJD, that makes sense. And finally, optic. so optic atrophy. So the reason I think this is useful is because it, transcends neurology and ophthalmology as well. So you can get here sort of um, this um, <coughs> um, what's it, sorry. Um, so the optic atrophy is 
obviously the classical thing we think about in in sort of a pale optic disc is MS. That's the sort of thing that we normally think, oh yeah, okay, MS. But actually on the most part, the optic atrophy has quite a wide differential. So obviously you can get this sort of vascular causes, you get infectious causes, you can get genetic causes as well. But the um the one of the main things I would think about is that you get nutritional optic atrophy where you just get sort of a lack of whatever, any vitamins, you know, loads of different vitamins. And then at least, especially for those who are alcoholic, for example, who just don't get enough food or whatever, um, that can lead to optic atrophy. So what I'm trying to say is that there's a very wide differential for optic atrophy, including genetic. So it's not just sort of an inflammatory cause as well. So um, what else is I going to say? So I think that is, uh, what are we doing? Aha, okay. So I think we got a feedback forum shared. Have you got it? Uh, so I've got some questions as well. We'll go through the questions and uh, yeah, thank you very much. That's uh, a very whistle stop tour through everything. Uh, one second. Let me, if you, Keats, would you mind just sending the feedback forum out, please? That's right. So um, thanks. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. I can't access the chat. Um, the general chat can only access the chat for the host and panelists. Okay, that's fine. Uh, let me just send that now. Sorry, guys, if you mind just feeling through the feedback form so that I know if this is a good lecture or not. Um, and I will need. To, I also doing it for my own portfolio. How exciting! Uh, so you know, it's. Hey, let me share my screen again. Any questions? Okay, so please, guys, if you're still there. Please, can you fill in the feedback form while we're doing questions? Um, very, very helpful. Because we kind of want to know if this is useful or not and if I need to sort of change stuff. Is that right? Thank you. I much appreciate it. Okay, so questions. Let's ask questions. So um, I'm going to go through them one by one. So again, I'm going to talk about... I'm only going to answer questions that are relevant for this lecture, I'm afraid. Sorry. Someone's saying that it pick isn't super clear for pale disc. Fair. I'll take your point um can't see comments okay fine people oh, okay the comments not working sorry uh huntington's no it was huntington's uh someone's asking for iih is mrv gold standard in practice of only see ctb so this is an interesting comment uh you mrv and ctb you can kind of do both as long as you're looking at the vein somehow doesn't really matter i would say that um the if you do a CTV and it's normal, you and the diagnosis is not IAH, for example, you can't see everything else. So sometimes it's easier to get an MRV, uh, just because it helps you to look at other stuff as well. So, but obviously, you know, that's within your local sort of guidelines, right? Um, can everyone see the feedback link, by the way, just so I know? Um, please let me know if you can actually see it. Can you see it, Keats? Feedback? Yeah, that's yeah, fine. That's fine. Right. Perfect. Um, and then so old lectures, uh, we yeah, so if you signed up to the previous ones, we will be sending them to you. I'm not gonna differentiate between lateral med and medial medullary syndromes, that's too niche. Sorry. If it's CIA, do you know how to start DOAC immediately? No. Uh so it kind of depends. So, like if you as in if you have a T definitely TIA and the, you've done an MRI, you wouldn't start it. They do it in TIA clinic. But yeah, you would start a DOAC if they do have AF, for example, or a cardiac thrombus. <laughs> uh do you wait 24 to eight hours before commencing high dose statin in stroke? Um no, no. I think that's they used to be really weird about statins like five, 10 years ago with, with hemorrhagic strokes. I think there was this big sort of RCT, not RCT, so there's lots of data, but then now and nowadays it doesn't really matter. No, so it's not, not something that so you think about. CT perfusion compared to CG angiogram. CT angiogram helps you to visualize the, the vessels. It's an angiography, whereas perfusion helps you to understand the diff the difference between how well the, uh, the, the brain tissue is perfusing, basically, uh, and sort of how well the... So what the difference is between brain that's already dead and the brain is at risk of being dead in the next sort of, you know, however many hours, uh, which is a sort of a source of great debate. Um, is seizure at onset of stroke a CI to thrombolysis? Uh, kind of, I guess in a way it's sort of, I would say it's a, it's a contradiction thrombolysis, but tends to, I think it'd be very unusual uh, 
to have a seizure at this onset of a stroke, uh, to be honest. So it makes you to doubt the diagnosis a bit. So maybe you may be less likely. But I don't think it's an absolute contradiction. Um, so present CRVS, I'm not going to talk about it. It's very too, too niche, sorry. Um, how does valparate result in limb paralysis? I don't know, actually. I don't know what the mechanism is. When would you give phosphenitone instead of phenytoin? Um, I think the study that I showed you, I think that I had phosphenitone. I think that was maybe an American thing. So they were using phosphenitone. Uh, you can use both. Do you know imaging changes in Parkinson's Plus? I think it's a bit too niche for, under, for uh, MRCP, to be honest with you. Hummingbird sign, yeah, probably um, worth knowing about, but I don't think it will come up, to be very honest with you. Parkinson's Plus syndromes, you kind of try and treat them in the same way to a certain extent as, um, uh, what do you call it, um, as idiopathic Parkinson's disease, but the treatment just works less well. So levodopa and upscaling of symptoms and downscaling. Yeah, so like I think levodopa, when you're giving someone levodopa, their uh, symptoms over time, they'll start having like things like on-off phenomena. They'll have things like freezing, and that might be a bit because it might make it difficult. So you normally sort of what you could do is you kind of keep them on the same dose, for example, or you reduce it, and then you put in something else. So you add like a dopamine antagonist, or you add something else, or you know like an apple morphine. That's kind of roughly how you would manage that. Um, someone's asking, would you oh, please feel feel in the feedback form, guys, for those who are still there. Um, Someone's asking, would you not think of IH or CBST for six nerve palsy? Uh, yeah, you can get it for sure. So anyone with a headache and a six nerve palsy, uh, you would consider CBST. That's fair. But normally, to be honest, from my experience, um, the most common presentation is just a painless sixth without anything. So actually, yeah. But if they have a headache, yeah, I would consider that for sure. Uh. Uh, patient with MS, tongue weakness, um, what would you think about? Uh, I don't know, actually. What would you think about? Yeah, I think MS, want to do an MRI, basically. And if it's acute, sort of very quick, yeah, I could consider it. Those, those ones, they tend to be sort of admitted sometimes for MRIs and things like that, um, if there's some diagnostic uncertainty. But it depends on the clinical syndrome. Um. Is it specifically natalizumab? No, so other ones can cause them, but natalizumab is the one that tends to be associated with JC virus. Um, how many spinal levels to be involved in transverse? I don't think there's a particular sort of uh, transverse myelitis, uh, spine, like spinal level. Um, Anti-MOG is a relatively newly described inflammatory cause of um, it tends to cause sort of spinal lesions, but can also cause brain lesions, and it's a differential for, um, and so it's a differential for sort of this longitudinally extensive lesions and just generally spinal lesions. Um, it's an antibody that we send. That's sort of roughly what it is. Um, so a patient with MFS who didn't give IVIG, they weren't that bad. So the thing about IVIG is that you. It doesn't, I don't think it's really associated with, if I recall correctly, with a sort of a quite significant, um, like long-term benefit. It just makes people get better quicker. So if they're not that bad, you tend to just pay them, especially if it's like, if they're okay. So that's something that you might consider not giving them. So that's that's probably why. I differentiate CIDP and GBS. CIDP, chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy is a chronic, acute or chronic condition that comes and goes, whereas GBS is an acute condition. Um, it's felt to me on the same spectrum, arguably, probably neuromuscular neurologists will say, no, that's not true. But gen that's how I think about it, at least, and for your purposes. Uh, when should you image a seventh nerve palsy? I know there are nice guidelines. I, I remember looking at the nice guidelines. If it's a bit weird, I think, in the nice guidelines, and you're not sure, there's some really good papers in practical neurology you can have a look at. Uh, if you're not sure and they look a bit, they sound a bit weird and it's been going on for a while, you should really image, to be honest. That's the that's my my understanding. Um yeah, paroxysmal hemicrania. Uh, yeah, that's so all these like headache syndromes and uh, these sort of it can get really obscure conditions. I'm I'm surprised that there's lots of MRCP questions about this. 
and Ukraine continue uh, and, and basically did this sort of it's basically what it what there what it is the paroxysmal hemicrania on one side or continuous pain on one side. Um, I'm yeah, I'm very surprised that that there's a lot. I would have thought this is a sort of quite niche. Uh, fine, okay, I'm just going to move on to the next stuff. So again, I, I feel it's quite niche to be honest, but I, I will have a look at it actually. And actually, to be honest, fair, I don't actually know that much about it. Actually, yeah, doing a headache. Um, my and doing a headache rotation next, so I probably I'll know more more about it. I don't know that much about it. I'm sorry. Um, if they present with thunderclap at 14 hours, do you bother doing a CT? Go straight for LP. No, you should always do a CT for doing LP. Uh, questions Are we doing gastro for MRSP? Yes, we're doing it in maybe January, February. Sorry if that's too late, but we're definitely doing it. Um, question on MRCP about fatigability with movement, but ACHR negative. Patient have thymoma. Yeah, so you can get ACHR negative mycenia. So, so basically, you don't need the antibodies to make the diagnosis. It's a clinical diagnosis generally. So if they have ACH receptors, obviously it helps, but they can be negative. So you just trick them anyway. So their diagnosis is uh, mycenia. And yeah, it could be related. Obviously, thymoma is relevant. Bulbar versus pseudobulbar palsy. So bulbar palsy is lower motor neuron. Bulbar palsy, pseudobulbar palsy is upper motor neuron. Bulbar palsy. Uh, that's kind of roughly how I differentiate it. Obviously, with the most common thing that we see is we see it in, you know, obviously we see in motor neuron disease, we can get mixed. But obviously in a thing something like a stroke, you can get um, sort of a pseudobulbar palsy. Um, implications of thymectomy on those without thymoma. Interesting question. I don't know. I would assume that probably it doesn't really make any big difference on their infections going forward. It probably doesn't matter also because you're also giving them loads of steroids and stuff, right? So actually, that's probably going to have the worst effect on their susceptibility rather than the vimoma, I would imagine, but I'm not sure. Uh, do we need to know about stiff man syndrome anti-GAD? It's a bit of a niche condition, but fair enough. Stiff man syndrome is something where you just get stiff all over and associated with anti-GAD uh, antibodies. The only thing that it's very much associated with is type 1 diabetes. I think those are sort of, that's the only thing you really need to know about it. Thunderclap headache. So it it doesn't matter how long it lasts. It's just that it needs to be sort of maximal at onset. Um, sorry, limb paralysis. More modern guidelines for thrombolysis come back to me. Should we use this for MRC questions? I don't know if they will ask you. See, very honest, very honestly, I think they may do because it's been a couple of years now. So I would, I would use them. Yeah, if they do ask you about it. Generally speaking, the way to think about it is that if they've got a good functional status and they've got good imaging criteria, you usually will do it if they're within the time window. For thrombectomy, it's up to twenty-four hours, right? Whereas for thrombolysis, it's nine hours. If you know those two things and you kind of think about the concepts, then I think that should be enough. Um, transverse myelitis. Why is it transverse? Um, interesting. Yeah, actually, I, I, that's a good question. I guess it's transverse because it sort of, it affects one plane of the, of the spinal cord, right? But again, you're right, it's quite long. So it's a bit weird. Why would it be called transverse? I don't know. Um. Yeah. Yeah. So you can get sensory motor disturbance. Yeah, that that's right. Interesting. Good question. I don't know. Um, is nethalism of the PML? Yeah. Can we get bilateral INO and GBS or MS? Yeah, I don't see why not. If you can, if you take out both, um, MLFs, medial longitudinal fasciculus. Um. When do we decide on PEG or RIG in MND patients? That tends to be in patients who have bulbar problems. Um, but it's a very specialist thing, to be fair. And it's like mixed, it's a it's a decision by the neurologist and the gastro team. And like it's not something that's sort of taken, you know, willy-nilly. It's a very discussed thing. Um okay. How do you how do you join in future sessions? So yeah, so we tend to post stuff on <laughs> Facebook and on Instagram and uh there's an email list as well that we tell people about. Um the okay and then yeah so future sessions you can stay out so if you if you follow us on instagram that's probably the best place to know where things are to be honest with you um okay so 
I should probably learn more about a part of my Ukrainian, continuous Ukrainian, to be honest. Yeah. Okay. I don't know the treatment. Does anyone know? Do we know the treatment to this? Yeah. Let me know. Um, I'll probably stop sharing. I'll stop recording, actually. Um, and then 